Hmm, I'm bored. Let's read a book. <gasps> Dusk was falling by the time we struggled with stops for water for Gerlock, and the vain attempts to stretch out the permanent cramps in my legs along the quagmire that was called the road to Hillwit. Even from the outskirts, I could tell Hillwit made Hrisbarg look like Imperial Hammer. Hrisbarg had rough wooden sidewalks. Hallett had none. Hrisbarg had defined streets. Hallett had a rough clump of structures. Hrisbarg's buildings had peeling paint. Hewlett's had none. But the rain had begun to fall as ice needles, and the wind howled from the north, freezing my cloak as solid as plate armor. Almost at the edge of Hallett was a careless building accompanied by another not much better than the large shack the snug inn and its stable. Gerlock whinnied as I led him inside the stable. Three pence and he'll share a stall with the other mountain pony, commanded the heavy set man by the sliding stable door. I looked at the small stable boy racking a saddle while the big man collected the stable boy shrugged. In the open space to the right stood an unhitched wagon and a coach that the same golden coach I had seen on the road to Freetown. I looked back at the heavy man to catch what he was saying. You stable him out of the man, darn ponies. Kill anyone, not their master. I handed over three pennies. At the end, there's another one like him there. I let Gerlock along the narrow way toward the back, and eased open the stall door, holding it so it didn't fall off the worn wooden hinge pins. Then glancing at the bleached and cracked support timbers of the stable itself, still wandering about the golden-finished white oak coach. Gerlock whinnied, and the other horse also whinnied, as I let Gerlock take his own time. Both sniffed the air while I wanted to sneeze. In time, I got him and unsaddled. I quickly stuffed the staff in the straw along with my pack and searched until I found an old brush. By then, the stable boy, not the collector, was watching. Any grain? He gave me a wary look, and I produced a copper penny. The boy produced the battered bucket and I split it between the two, although I gave Gerlock the largest share. Finally, I felt Gerlock was settled enough for me to chance the inn. Once inside, the odor of unwashed herders, rancid oils, stale perfumes, and smoke left my eyes stinging. Squinting through the haze, I peered over the crowded tables. Those in the back, toward the narrow but drafty door, through which I had entered, were long trestle tables with benches. Beyond were square tables of a darker and polished wood. Between the two types of tables ran a flimsy half wall with three wide openings for the inn servers. Everyone on the road to or from Hallett seemed stranded in the same inn. On my side of the half wall, Men and women were shoulder to shoulder at trestle tables. A few of the tables for local gentry, or whoever the privileged ones might be, had vacant chairs around them, but none of the tables were unclaimed. The Snug Inn, despite its name, was not snugly built. Uncle Sardet would have listed in detail all the faults in the construction. While I scarcely had his experience, there were some poor design features evident even to me. The outside eaves were not long enough to keep the wind from blowing underneath and into the upstairs rooms. Likewise, the stone facing of the front had been built for style and was beginning to pull away from the heavy timbers that framed the side walls. The curves in the rough beams had been framed both sides and front, as walls showed, they had not been properly treated or cured. Inside was worse. 
The hallway dividers separating the common and gentry sections had been carelessly sawed and nailed together with small spikes, needlessly splitting the wood. After my short tenure with Uncle Sardet, I could have done better and probably done it quicker than whoever had built them. The gentry's tables were square, sharp-edged, and probably gave the inn servants bruises. Again, a few minutes with a plane or even a shaping saw would have produced a better and more serviceable table. The common tables were green oak trestles, sawed or split before the wood had cured, with am the amount of red oak, black oak, and even maple available in Kandar. I wondered why the stables were green oak. I looked over the mass of people wincing at the din. Though I had stood there for what seemed a long time, no one even looked at me. Finally, I made out a space on the bench next to a man in a rough brown coat, halfway across the back of the commons area. I edged towards it. Watch it, young pup. My apologies, I offered the man whose elbow I had jostled. Even as I ducked past him, he glared over the edge of the chip ceramic mug he had held to his beard-encircled mouth. Won't bring back the med. Mirthless time for a storm, lass. More med. From the smell, whatever med was, it didn't have any desire to taste it. Nor did I have much desire to stay in the snug inn, except that I was hungry. Since I hadn't learned how to eat hay or oats, that meant entering the inn. I looked at the space behind the man in brown, then shrugged and eased myself into place, wishing somehow I had brought the staff, but knowing it was safer in the straw of Gerlach's stall. I still didn't like leaving it. You? asked the brown man, bearded and hunched over his mug of steaming cider. From his muscles and his belt, I would have guessed a carpenter. Of course, he didn't know me. I hadn't told him. Laris used to be a woodworker before I left home. All of which was true enough. Woodworker. Too darn fire for that. He glared at me. I sighed. All right, I was an apprentice woodcrafter. Never got further than benches and breadboards. Ha, huh, at least you're honest, boy. No one would admit that, weren't it true? Then he glanced back at his cider, ignoring me. Left to my own devices, I waved at the serving girl. A black-haired and skinny thing, she wore a sleeveless brown leather vest and wide skirts. She ignored me as well, so I began to study the people while I waited for her to get close enough for me to insist on something. At the table closest to the hearth sat four people, a woman veiled below her eyes, wearing a loose-fitting green tunic over a white blouse, and presumably trousers. She was the only veiled woman I had ever seen. But if her lower face was unknown, her clothes were tight enough to reveal that her figure, at least, was desirable. Her forehead was darkish, as were her heavy eyebrows and hair. Bound with a golden card into a cone shape, over the back of her chair was a heavy coat of white fur I had never seen. Two of the other men were clearly fighters wearing surcoats I could not identify, and the bowl cut of hair worn under a helmet. One fighter was older, white-haired and grizzled, but his body seemed younger. His black was to me, and I could not see his face. Though I would have guessed it was on mine, despite the white hair. The other fighter was thin, Youngish, with a face like a weasel, and dark black hair to match. Between them, across from the woman, half facing the fire, was a man in spotless white. 
even from that distance more than ten cubits. I could see his eyes were old, though he looked more like Koldar's age, perhaps a trace older, perhaps even into his third decade. But the eyes had seen more, and I shivered and dropped my glance as I turned in my direction. The man in white smiled. His smile was friendly, reassuring, and everyone in the dining area of the saloon relaxed. I could feel the wave of relaxation, and I fought it off, just because no one was going to tell me what to feel. Was he the one who rode in the golden coach? You in the black, I see you're cold. Would you like some warmth? I felt he was looking at me, but his fingers pointed at the three figures huddled against the timbered wall behind me and to my left. The two men and the woman, all clad in shapeless gray padded jackets that marked them as herders of some sort, ignored the question and looked down. Fine. I can tell you you've come in from the blizzard's chill. The warmth is on me. He gestured, and in our corner of the long room, I could feel the dampness of the chill dissipate, though we were far from the fire. The woman looked away from the wizard, for that was clearly it had to be, and made a motion, as if to reject the heat. The two men looked down. Me, for the first time since Gerlock and I had ridden out of Hrisbarg, I felt comfortably warm, as if the long table where I sat were one before the hearth, rather than the farthest from the fire. Yet the heat thrown by the wizard chilled me as well inside, and it felt familiar, as if I too could have called it forth, though I didn't know how, nor did I want to try. A small table in the corner nearest the hearth sat another man, the only person in the crowded inn sitting alone. He wore a dark gray, long-sleeved tunic, belted over similar trousers by an even darker belt. A dark gray leather cloak over the chair beside him. His hair was a light brown that seemed gray, though from a distance he did not appear old. The man in gray, I mumbled to the carpenter. Alrin, call me Alrin. His eyes were glazed, not with alcohol, but as if he had been looking somewhere else. Lass, more cider. Alrin waved the brown mug in the air. Several drops of cider slashed across my face after wiping the cider off of the back of my hand. I asked, Alrin, who's the man in gray? Justin, gray wizard. Almost as bad as the white one. Antonin. Antonin will take your soul and your body, so they say. He waved the mug again. This time the serving girl turned toward us. What's for the traveler? I made my voice hard. Her eyes turned to me from the mug she had lifted from Alan's hand, running over my dark cloak, sandy hair, and fair skin. Perhaps you should join the dark one, young sir. Alrin looked at me again. I doubt I could f afford such a luxury. The girl, for she had, could not be of much older than I, actually flashed a quick smile before her face turned cold and professionally false again. Two pence for the fire and five pence for the cider. Mad is ten pence a mug. Food, cheese and black bread is ten pence. Cheese and a beer and black bread is twenty. Cheese and black bread with a cider. Twenty-two pence. She paused. Now. I shrugged. Half now and half when I get the food. Someone will take the cider. Her face looked bored and tired already. Fine. Twelve now for fire and cider. Ten when you get the bread and cheese. I fished twelve pence from my belt glad in this surely lot I had managed some change in Hersberg. You'll break a traveler in this weather. You could stay outside. She slipped the coins through a narrow slot into a locked and hardened leather purse on an equally heavy leather belt. 
and handed me a wooden token. Then she was picking up mugs and coins all the way along the table, passing out tokens as she stacked the empty mugs on the heavy wooden tray. The door behind me opened, and another rush of cold chilled the black side of the common room again. A pair of road soldiers stood there, wearing heavy, short riding jackets, swords, and carrying long-barreled rifles used in peacekeeping, not in warfare, not when the smallest of chaos spells destroyed their effectiveness. A thin man wearing greasy brown apron and waved a truncheon toward the pair. It really is. Stores noy. The bigger soldier, four cubits tall, was as much as flab as muscle, jabbed the other, a man not much taller than the serving girl. Then the two walked toward the innkeeper in the kitchen. Conversations dropped to whispers, or less, and the two made their way toward the innkeeper. The heavier soldier had said something to the thin innkeeper, who looked puzzled. The soldier raised his voice. Said demon horseman seen on the side of Dukes of Freetown's lands, repeated the smaller soldier. Demon weather anyway, roaches, mumbled Alrin the carpenter. Why? I asked, wondering about the demon horseman. Paid by Montgrin Council to keep the roads safe between the border and Hewlett. Passed by the Thieves' Guild for an exemption. Alrin looked toward the servant girl. Where's the cider? The road soldiers went through the wide stone arch into the kitchen, and the servant girl came out, holding high a tray of mugs, somehow not spilling any of them. Vapor whispered from the hot cider as she neared the chilly end of the common area where we sat. Dark-haired server avoided my eyes as she set the mug down before me and the next before Alrin. Look, I yelled in Alrin's ear, pointing toward the wizard in white. Carpenter started, and I switched mugs with him. Look where? Just Antonin? He pointed this way, I tried to explain. Yell not at me, youth. I am sorry, and I was, but not because I had yelled. Alrin looked at the cider, but did not drink immediately. I took a sip of mine. Ooh. The searing of my tongue and throat explained why the carpenter had waited. Ash dropped over the gantry and common areas of the snug inn. I saw that the man in white was standing, looking over at Justin, the Grey Wizard, whatever a Grey Wizard was. A deed more than a deed, said Justin, so softly I could not hear all of his words. A deed is a deed. Do a parents really receive? Justin the Grey? Anson had stood by his table. The woman in green tunic ignored Antonin. Her veiled face turned towards Justin. The Grey Wizard said nothing. Nor did he even stand. Actions speak louder than words. There are those here who hunger. Will righteousness feed them? Will the innkeeper feed them from the goodness of his heart and deprive his family and kin? That is an old argument, Antonin. One scarcely worth answering. Is it wrong to feed the hungry, Justin? The wizard in gray shook his head, almost sadly. I wondered how he would answer the white wizard's question. Is it wrong to feed the hungry, Justin? Even the herders in the corner turned toward Antonin. You, among the herders, does one of you have an old goat? A tired ewe that will not survive the winter? Come, two silvers for such an animal, certainly a fair price. I found myself nodding. Even in early winter, a fair price for an animal that might easily die in the frigid eight days ahead. The wizard in gray shook his head once more, then sipped from his mug, watching Antonin 
beamed from where he stood at the table. Innkeeper, for the use of your serving table, a sir silver also. The innkeeper, wiping his thin hands on the greasy apron he wore, smiled briefly, not with his eyes, as he looked at the crowd. Enough, esteemed wizard, but I would hope in your charity that you would make good any damages. There will be no damages, Antonin gestured toward the herders. Who will take my two silvers? Here, Lord Wizard. A bent man shuffled forward, his curly and dirty gray hair springing wildly from his head. His leathers were filthy, so battered their original color was lost beneath the dirt, and so tattered that the yarn laced through the, them and around them barely seemed to hold either his vest or his trousers together. Dirty raw wool poked from the hose and the trousers and vest. Bring me the animal. Will he slaughter it here in the inn? I asked. Orm chuckled. You'll see no knives here, youngster. The one's a great wizard. Too great, mumbled the traveler on my other side, who had said nothing since I had seated myself. He turned to his companion, an older man dressed in a faded green with a heavy green cloak still wrapped around him. A chill wind bit through my own trousers as the herder left. Through the doorway was open only an instant or so. Outside, the wind was beginning to moan, and the dark early dusk was nearly gone. I wondered how much more ice would fall before I could leave the inn. Or would it be snow by morning? Alrin's slurp reminded me of the mug I held between both hands. I sipped my cider carefully, but could taste nothing foreign. Still, I waited after my first sip. Thunk. Ten pence! The serving girl laid down two heavy slabs of ba black bread and a thin wedge of yellow cheese. And the token back. I handed her the token and silver. Now, now I had cheese and bread, and I wondered if I could eat it safely. As I glanced toward the gantry section, I found the eyes of the gray wizard upon me. He nodded slightly, as if to say that I could. I looked at the cider between Elrond's hands. The wizard's face was unreadable, which was an answer enough. But why would he even answer my unspoken question? And why did I trust the man in gray and not the one in white? Taking a small bite from the tangy black bread, I tried to figure out the answers. Tamara would have called me a fool for even entering the inn. Samuel would have shared the stable with the animals. And who was to say who was right? The outside door opened wider and the wind dispersed the lingering warmth that had grown from the body heat of the crowd. I swallowed another chunk of the dry bread, washing it down in the lukewarm cider. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss out on any of these videos. See y'all in the next one. Goodbye!